pinning down the butterfly of acting is rather a daunting quest. And pinning down the butterfly of acting in high comedy, I think is even more daunting because that particular kind of comedy beats its wings faster and it uh, has more brilliant colours than any other kind of comedy. Actually, I think acting is a, a slightly mysterious process, uh, even for those who do it. Well, actually, especially for those who do it. Uh, and I never thought of analysing what it was that happened to me, or that I did, when I was in a high comedy, and I've been in quite a few of them, until I was asked to teach, or really more or less forced to teach, a course on high comedy. And to my real astonishment, I discovered that there was a pattern to what I did. And I offer it to you now, not because I think it's holy writ, which it isn't, but because it, it isn't second-hand theory. It's a, a discovery made on the battlefield. And uh, I made an awful lot of mistakes in front of the paying public to reach these conclusions. The, the extracts I've chosen, and <coughs> I've chosen a great many, uh, are from plays like Congreve's The Way of the World, Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, uh, Noel Coward's Private Lives. And none of those authors settled down one afternoon and said, uh, look here, I'm going to write a high comedy. Somebody put a label on afterwards. And labels are extremely dangerous, because, especially literary labels, because they make one lazy. And you think, oh, I'm in a high comedy. There's a way of doing this. Well, I'm prepared to admit they are high comedies in the sense that they are plays set against a very specific period background. Uh, and the characters in them are bound by the manners and conventions of that period or get tripped up by the manners and conventions of that period because they're different. Sometimes these plays are called comedies of manners. But poor old high comedy is fenced in by a kind of minefield of misunderstood theatrical words. One of them is wit. The, the people in these plays are not posh in the sense that they are kings and queens or lords and ladies but they are of the leisured classes. They are of a class that had the time to indulge in verbal assurance, to enjoy wit, to use language as a weapon. So wit is intrinsic to these plays. And wit is a word that disables actors because they think, I've got something terribly clever to say. Uh, I'm a mouthpiece of a convoluted idea, and I'll spit it out very clearly, and the audience will laugh. Unfortunately, audiences have got the idea that humour is something you laugh at and wit is something you give a vinegary smile at because that's what actors sometimes conclude, that you don't really have to do more than speak it. In fact, these plays, more, more than any others, need warming up from underneath. The, the characters have to be fleshed, really fleshed by you. And the information is there if you do your, uh, your Poirot stuff and you look in, on the page for the clues. You will find the material to bring them alive. Another dangerous word uh, to do with these plays is style. And that's got corrupted because actors, again, think that style is what you saw in the last production. And so when they saw somebody w waving a fan dementedly, they sort of put it into the next play they're in, thinking, well, that's period acting. So what you must do is your research. And you don't have to be uh, talented to do that. You just have to be diligent to do that. Uh, you must know, for example, that uh, a bawdy joke in a restoration play is acceptable. Uh, in a Victorian play, if uh, a man says something coarse to a woman, she'd c come over all queer and rush off and be modest. Well, that wouldn't happen in a restoration play. She'll whop back a response or ignore it or deal with it in an equal kind of way. Um, you can bear a lot of bosom in a restoration play and not be a tart. You can, if you're a man, display a well-turned calf and sit like this in a chair and you're not a male model. Um, one needs to know those things. The real question is how to tackle these plays. And because I'm queen amnesia and my students aren't much better that I teach, I've invented a rather stupid mnemonic initials to remind me which are S-N-E-T, SNET, pretty word, uh, which stands for subtext, naturalism, energy, and turning on an emotional sixpence. And I would like to have called turning on an emotional sixpence 
slalom, but then the mnemonic would have been SNES, and nobody would have remembered with two S's. Slalom is that uh, thing, as I'm sure you all know in skiing, when you come down the mountain and there's a course of posts which you have to twist very fast in and out. Very skillful, difficult business. So to begin with the first one, subtext, uh, an important and recurring feature of high comedy is the fact that people very rarely say precisely what they mean. Language is a kind of decoy from the main intention. Uh, for example, in um, Design for Living by Noel Coward, Gilda says, there isn't any more mustard. And what she actually means is, when are you going to seduce me? This is clear to the audience without her hammering it. In The Way of the World, Millamant says, I think I'll endure you. And she actually means, I'm dying to marry you. Uh, Gwendolyn says, I'm so sorry, dearest Cecily, if, I, if this has been any disappointment to you. And she means, I am thrilled to bits to be messing up your plans, you little bitch. Uh, now, the, the beauty of subtext is that you only have to identify it. That's all. And it permeates how you say the line. Now, if you do more than that, it isn't irony, which is what we're looking for. It is nudge, nudge. So you have to trust it. You have to, it may happen in rehearsal that you actually speak the subtext and, and find out that way precisely what you are thinking, what you are feeling, what you want, as opposed to what you are saying. When those two are at, are at odds, what you want and what you say, that is irony, and that is the kind of subtext you're dealing with in these plays. Pray, let me introduce myself. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? What a very sweet name. Something tells me we are going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How nice of you to like me so much after we've only known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. Then that is all quite settled, is it not? I hope so. Yes, good. Let's just take that again, uh, that section, and substitute <coughs> the truth before the spoken top layer. Yes, and I'll might, stop you I if think I think we, we haven't quite got it. All over. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Pray let me introduce myself. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? What a very nauseating provincial name. What a very sweet name. Something tells me that I'm not going to like you at all. Something tells me that we are going to be great friends. Yes, first impressions are never wrong, and uh, I don't like you already, and I've been lying through my teeth till now. My first impressions of people are never wrong. How very strange of you to say that you like me so much and you haven't even met me. I can't understand these people who come from town who s say things they don't mean. How nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other such a comparatively short time. Pray do, sit down. Well, I suppose <coughs> I'd make a make some sort of pretense at friendship here, so, um... I may call you Cecily, may I not? With pleasure. Whatever you want. And I suppose I'd better get her to call me Gwendolyn, and then we'll see if I can butt her up that way. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? <laughs> yes, if you wish. Right, we've got that over with. Then that's quite settled, is it? <laughs> Yes, I do hope so. <clears throat> did you, just to stop you there, did you, know, did you notice something about their weaponry? Mm -hmm. uh, that is already evident from that. The thing that struck me that time was that actually Cecily manages to tell the truth with inflection. She didn't have to change her words that mm. much. Yeah. Whereas Gwendolyn, the urbanite, actually says radically the opposite of, of what she means, has to totally distort everything. So the kind of corresponding um, urgency, gush if you like, of somebody who's turning the truth absolutely on its head, which she is, uh, is needed. And it is already bumping you up in what you say. 
uh, yours isn't. It's actually quite comparatively subtle because you're fairly near the truth. The way you choose to phrase it mm. isn't. You're not. In, you're not playing the same game. I, actually, I thought before they rather were playing the same game, but they're not. Naturalism in these plays, not all plays, but in these plays, is a question of taming the language until it sounds as if you thought of it in that instant, you that moment, no matter how convoluted the, 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 the dialogue, that you thought of it that second and spoke it yourself. Uh, you have to be so at home with the subclauses and the polysyllables that you can whack them about like a dead animal and they will do what you want. And I think that's true of all plays, but with these ones, because the language is so defined and strong, sometimes one tends to wallow in it and expect it to do the work. But it doesn't. It just disappears, unless you sustain it uh, from underneath. Right, well, we're going to do a bit of the way of the world. This is the wooing scene um, between Mirabel and Milliman. Uh, you know that people in restoration plays, their names are a huge clue to, to what they are. What do you think uh, Mirabel signifies? Anybody got any notions what it might be? Admire beautiful women. Yes, admiring beauty. Uh, Milliman? She's a thousand lovers. A thousand lovers, exactly. It's a very mannered scene in a lot of ways, but fundamentally it is an extremely erotic one. Uh, these are, well, they are a fop and a coquette. I mean, very well dressed, witty. Um, with all the, the, the sort of significant characteristics of the high-class people of the time, they're most of all a man and a woman. And if we lose sight of that, then it becomes rather a brittle ball, this scene. So what I really want to do is to find out the fundamentals and for, well, make sure we know what the language means. Find out the fundamental moods and then start really trying to use the language properly. Ah, idle creature, get up when you please. And do you hear I won't be called names after I'm married? Positively, I won't be called names. Names? Aye, as wife, spouse, my dear, joy, jewel, love, sweetheart, and all the rest of that nauseous cant with which men and their wives are so fulsomely familiar. I shall never bear that. That was wrong. <laughs> it, it wasn't wrong, but, but there is... A, a very important thing about lists, which is you, you really have to have a separate attitude. And I've constantly reiterated this, that you must have a specific attitude to everything that, ha that passes your lips, absolutely everything. That's the whole point of a list, that it isn't a blanket of, of, of thought. These are all different words, and I need to know. Very, it's so terribly difficult to get them up to speed, but I need to know what your attitude is. And what about the pacing? Worry about the pacing second. Let's first find the attitudes. Now, this can be enormously helped by the person she's playing to. Oliver, would you take over for, 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 as a Mirabel and give her a, rather a hard time on the next list? Um, because this one, again, is very important to try to understand why she extends certain bits of it. Perfect, perfectly simple request suddenly has another bit tacked on. Why? So th let's go on from there. Have you any more conditions to offer? Hitherto, your demands are pretty reasonable. Trifles? As liberty to pay and receive visits to and from whom I please. Okay. To write and receive letters without interrogatories or wry faces on your part. <laughs> to wear what I please. And to choose my conversation with regard only to my own taste. To have no obligation upon me to converse with acquaintances because, no, to have no obligation upon me to converse with wits that I don't like because they're I'd your never, acquaintance. I'd never thought. Or to be intimate with fools because they may be your relations. <laughs> my relations. To come to dinner when I please. To dine in my dressing room when I'm out of humour no, without giving up. a reason. To have my closet inviolate. To be sole oh, empress to of my tea table, which you must never presume to approach without first asking leave. And lastly, wherever I am, you must always knock on the door before you come in. Why are you suspicious? These things subscribed. 
These are articles. These articles. Sorry, I was wondering whether you wanted me no, to no, go I, on. I, I, actually, I was beginning to believe you. Oh. I really was. I, was I kept waiting for you when you could stop uh, it, You were doing this thing which I so want, which is new minting the thought. And it was when you began to really get in your way and you began to forget the words that you came whamming back with something with sufficient force and, and definition for, for me then to believe in. It just came up several notches. And your concentration came up to get it across to him. And then, then suddenly it was in 3D for me. There is one other thing about naturalism, which is that because it takes quite a long time to tame it and to make it your own, uh, you, you will crank up to speed. And then, having done that, uh, you will be as clever and as agile as you, the character is. And it is the most wonderful feeling when that happens. It's like swimming through silk. You are so powerful because you're as clever as they are. To be as clever as Beatrice, Benedict, Mirabel, Milliman, it's terribly heady. It's a thrilling experience. And in order to do it, you need one crucial quality, which is mental energy. Energy is the E of SNEP. And that means you have to think down the middle, the center of the thought, as you say it. Really good actors are, are taken by surprise by the next event in the script. It, it arrives and then may deal with it. And I cannot say it often enough that in high comedy there's only one moment and that moment is now. You also need the kind of energy that brings to life people referred to in the script or events or anything like that referred to in the script. I'm thinking specifically of, I was in a play called The Women, which is actually more of a satire than a high comedy, in which there are about 30-something women's parts. I think only about 18 of us played them. And they talk incessantly about uh, their husbands, their lovers, their exploitative employers, none of whom ever appear on the stage. And it was absolutely vital that we, the cast, all had an idea about these offstage men. And so we would bring in pictures of the people we thought were like the man we were married to, or we'd describe them. And it made all the difference because when they were referred to, supposing I was in my character talking about how much my husband adored me, and all the others knew that he was rampantly unfaithful and that he was four foot three and we made a rather ridiculous couple. You know, there were little slithery glances going between them which enriched the text enormously. Now, it's easy to say, um, and hard to understand, I think, and, but it's easy to prove. Would you mind reading for me a little <laughs> bit from School for Scandal by Richard Brinsley Sheridan, which uh, is a gossip scene. It's, uh, I, I would say, a um, fairly malevolent gossip scene, but of course passes muster socially. These people meet regularly and tear apart the reputations of various other people. Now, I'll die, but you are so scandalous, I'll forswear your society. What's the matter, Mrs. Gandalf? They'll not allow our friend, Miss Vermillion, to be handsome. Oh, surely she's a pretty woman. Oh, I'm very glad you think so, ma'am. She has a charming fresh colour. Yes, when it is fresh put on. Oh, <laughs> hi, I'll swear her colour is natural. I have seen it come and go. <laughs> oh, I dare swear you have, ma'am. It goes of a night and comes again in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> How I hate to hear you talk so. Oh, but surely now her, her sister is very handsome. Oh, she's evergreen. <laughs> oh, no, no, the other sister. She has many sisters. Yeah, they but are she's six old. and fifty if she's an hour. Oh, now positively you wrong her. Fifty-two or fifty-three at the utmost. <laughs> oh. Now, I don't think she looks more. No, there is no judging by her looks unless one could see her face. Well, well, yeah. if Mrs. Evergreen does take some pains to repair the ravages of time, you must allow that she affects it with great ingenuity. And that's surely better than the careless manner in which the widow of... Oka. Oka. <laughs> it, the careless manner in which the widow Oka corks her wrinkles. Nay, <laughs> now, Lady Snowwell, you are severe upon the widow. Come, come. It is not that she paints so ill, but when she has finished her face, she joins it so badly to her neck <laughs> that she looks like a mended statue in which the connoisseur sees at once at the head's mob. <laughs> uh, though the uh, trunk's antique. <laughs> <laughs> well said, no. <laughs> well, you make me laugh, but I vow I hate you for it. Good. Now, what's absolutely missing is the thing that I'm talking about, which is that the feeling that you react mm. to the image of the person. Those people may have meant something to the person who's saying them. I did feel that content had been 
bumped up a little. That there might have been a dim concept of who Mrs. Evergreen was, but not that the concept was received by anyone. Mm. Why don't you substitute names that you that you all know? Substitute famous modern names. Oh, but surely now you'll uh, you'll agree that her sister is or was very handsome. Oh, who? Joan Collins. Oh, la! <laughs> she's she's six and fifty feet an hour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Positively, you wrong her. Yeah. 52 or 53 at the <laughs> utmost. <laughs> oh, really, I don't think she looks more. Well, there is no judging by her looks unless one could see her face. You could. Well, well, if Joan Collins does take some pains to repair the ravages of time, <laughs> you must allow that she affects it with great ingenuity. And surely... That's better than the careless manner in which uh, Barbara Cartland <laughs> talks her in. Nay, now, Lady Snowwell, you are too severe upon Barbara Cartland. <laughs> it is not that she paints so well, but when she has finished her face, she joins it on so badly to her neck that she looks like a mended statue, <laughs> in which the connoisseur sees at once that the head's modern, though the trunk's antique. <laughs> well said, that's it. Well, you make me laugh, but I vow I hate you for it. <laughs> so the point I'm making is this. Not only have you got to be specific yourself uh, and have an, an, a here and now image of somebody when you, sit, when you, when you refer to them, or uh, with your, if you're describing a front door, it doesn't matter, you've got to have an image of it. The person you're talking to must also have it. Now, it may not be the kind of one you need to discuss, but in this instance, you definitely need to know, the actors have to say to each other, now, look, what are you thinking about with your... Uh, Miss Evergreen or your widow Oka. And then the whole thing actually begins to spark. There's another device, and I stress this is a device, practically a party game, um, to do with the energy of repartee. Now, repartee is a very particular kind of wit which crops up in these plays a lot. When one person picks up material from, an, from the previous speaker and uses it as ammunition to fire back at them, makes capital out of something they've just said. For example, in uh, Much Ado About Nothing, um, Benedict says to Beatrice, what, my dear lady, disdain, are you yet living? And she says, remember he said disdain and living. And she says, is it possible disdain should die while it has such meat food to feed it as Senior Benedict? Now her reply is based entirely on what he said. He's thought up the idea of disdain and he's used the word living. She immediately twists that to her own advantage, capitalizing on the idea by saying, how can disdain die while it's got somebody like you to keep it going? Uh, and the entire scene is worked like that, that one or other of them capitalizes on the last person's thought. And it was, it was in fact, a recognized form of wit, repartee, and they all rather prided themselves on it, because you had to be jolly quick to do it. There's um, <coughs> a, a trick to it, which is that because the audience has to understand how it works, you cannot be artificially speedy in your retort. Now, in that uh, exchange I've just described to you, Beatrice doesn't get her bullet, the word living, until the end of the sentence. So that word really has to hit the audience's ear and hers before she can turn it to her own advantage and return it. And I was talking to a, a voice teacher who told me that it's physiologically true that when you have a new idea, you breathe in. Now, inspiration is a word that is used by doctors and, of course, in poems and things, old-fashioned language, for breathing in. So you have two kinds of inspiration when you have an idea. You inspire and you have an inspiration. Now, if you obey that when you get your idea, it will give you the correct timing. You won't whammy in with your cue so fast that you kill the idea for the audience. Now, I call this receiving the baton of thought, like in a relay race. You know, the baton is passed to you, and you must stand still and receive it. And only when you've got it can you race on with the race. There's only one thing left to say now, to tell you about it in which is turning on an emotional sixpence, or the slalom. And that means emotional changes. You have to occupy and abandon with equal alacrity. So while you take on an emotion, very fast. You've also got to be able to shed it and move on to the next. And it may even, this is a big territory to explore in a few sentences, but it may even define the difference between comedy and tragedy, because the same emotions occur in both. And I think it is the speed with which you're able to abandon one and adopt another that helps to make things rather clear to you and the audience. It doesn't mean that the emotion is any less genuine while you're occupying 
that moment. But it's a tremendous discipline not to anticipate and not to look back, not to let it bleed sideways into what's coming. And we, we will work on one or two things where that is a very demanding feature of it all. Having said that, there is one other aspect of the slalom course, which is uh, difficult to describe and a bit dangerous to describe because it can go so wrong, but I think it's crucial to acting, which is that you have to have a sense of the whole course that lies before you, before you can tackle it. If you do this with too great a fervor, you are a sort of director up there who, who won't really be part of the proceedings, um, just an adjudicator of the play. If you do it not at all, then you'll be the worst kind of method performer, very indulgent, who just honestly only knows about the moment, and the moment could go on forever, as far as they're concerned, if they're having a good time. Um, it's, a, it's a very finely judged business. But, and you only know it, really, in performance, I think. And we certainly won't get that far, but uh, I do urge you to cultivate the uh, tiny bit of the back of your head for that purpose. Look, I think we ought to do this slalom business. And I think the slalom course, to end all slalom courses in British drama, is actually in the rivals, in, mostly in the hands of the character Falkland, who's a very volatile fellow. And before this scene, which we're going to look at, he's been teased by Jack Absolute and Bob Akers and been told that uh, his fiancée, Julia, has had the temerity to enjoy herself at a ball where he has not been in the country. And he goes completely his bananas and becomes embarrassingly hysterical. Uh, he refers to it rather lightly in this scene. And so it's necessary that we all know that he's already disgraced himself in this context. He's come back to check up on her. And within this uh, scene, he makes extraordinary changes of attitude. Now, jealousy is actually not a very funny emotion. And when it's used in some plays, like Othello, we know the kind of effect it has on an audience. Uh, what is it about a serious emotion like jealousy in a comedy that makes it funny? And I think one of the things is the speed with which it is abandoned, altered, yeah. considered. It's the most difficult thing to do because you have to identify what the emotion is, occupy that emotion totally for that moment, and then abandon it and go on to the next. And he has, in one speech particularly, about 15 of them, one after another. I've uh, picked up this edition of The Rivals, and I've got a slight prejudice against academics who write things about plays. I honestly think they look at them in a different way from those of us that have to get up and do them. And I've always thought this scene was extremely funny when it's done well. And it's described here um, uh, that the scenes between Julia and Falkland are boring, <laughs> it says here. <laughs> Julia especially is given an artificial high-flown language to speak. Um, Sheridan is putting on his official literary style. He's sending up literary style. There was a kind of uh, playwriting called sentimental. It was a, the name of a style. And Sheridan is mocking it in this scene. He does give them rather artificial diction. Uh, it doesn't lessen the extent of their feelings at all. You've got to get your tongue and your brain in harness over this and, and lick this language into shape and make it yours. Uh, because it does express what they feel. And the fact it's high flown is only a by blow of it. So try to treat it as if it weren't, and it will do its own work. Try to tame it. At the beginning of the scene, and again at the end, mm. he's on his own and he's talking. And yes. Who's he talking to? I, mean, I think he's talking to himself, and the way that one does, when you arrive at the d door of the doctor's surgery and there's nobody there, and you say, But he told me nine o'clock. And you're not talking to anyone, you're voicing your own frustration. Yeah. They told me Julia would return directly. I wonder she has not yet come. How mean does this captious, unsatisfied temper of mine seem to my cooler judgment? Yet I know not that I indulge it in any other point but on this one subject, and to this one subject, whom I think I love beyond my life. I am ever ungenerously fretful and madly capricious. I am conscious of it. Yet I cannot correct myself. She's coming. OK, yes. before you get in onto the set. Um, 
the, I, I need, you actually had identified the changes, but I need them presented three times, I don't mean as big in terms of uh, overactively big, I just mean presented with more intensity. I mean, where the hell is she? They, yeah. She said she was going to be here. Now that's not, I, I'm perfectly capable of responding to somebody's lateness with that degree of intensity, and it's not, sure. not untrue. And then I wish that instead of taking time to slowly stagger around the slalom pole and say, gosh, this, that sounded a bit off. How mean does this seem to me? Uh, you caught yourself the second you'd said it. So where the hell is she? Oh, God, I wish I didn't talk like that. I don't, I, I, I'm not like that at all, really. Each thing bumps up against the other. You want to supplant one emotion with the other, pull the rug out from under one and, and lamb in the next one. They told me Julia would return directly. I wonder she has not yet come. How mean does this captious, unsatisfied temper of mine appear to my cooler judgment? Yet I know not that I indulge it in any other point but on this one subject. And to this one subject, whom I think I love beyond my life, I am ever ungenerously fretful. Yes, very good, but not quite clear enough. There were three things there. One right. is, where the hell is she? The second thing is, uh, God, that's, that's a very bad aspect of me. And then there's a justification, but actually, it's her fault, because I don't do this to anyone else. I'm a oh, wonderful right, yes. man. Where do you want to go from? I think you better go from, uh, from the nimbleness of her tread. Right. She's coming. Yes, I know the nimbleness of her tread when she thinks her impatient Falkland counts the moments of her stay. Hadn't hoped to see you again so soon. Could I, Julia, be contented with my first welcome, restrained as we were by the presence of a third person? Oh, Falkland, when your kindness can make me this happy, let me not think I discovered something of a coldness in your first salutation. No, it was but your fancy, Julia. I was rejoiced to see you. You're, you're taking this at too simple a level, yes. because you're telling us that this man is potentially a bit dodgy. Yes. I'm getting that from you. Yes. Now, somebody who actually spends their life with somebody who is potentially a bit dodgy is much more soothing than that with them. If what you're really trying to do is avert disaster, don't give me the message that we're dealing with a madman here. Yes. Just be very kind and firm and good until he actually snaps. Yes. You really did sound as if you've got a hy hyper hypodermic in your back pocket <laughs> <laughs> when you came on then. <laughs> <laughs> We're preparing to sedate. Say that you thought of Falkland in the dance. I never can be happy in your absence. Believe me, Falkland, I mean not to upbraid you when I say that I have often dressed sorrow in smiles, lest my friends should discover whose unkindness had caused my tears. You were ever all goodness to me. Oh, I am a brute when I but admit a doubt of your true constancy. Right, say that again and say it with much more emotion. And then say it again with much more emotion. Okay. Three times. <coughs> you were ever all goodness to me. Oh, I am a brute when I admit to a, but admit to a doubt of your true constancy. And again. You were ever all goodness to me. Oh, I am a brute when I but admit a doubt of your true constancy. You were ever all goodness to me. Oh, I am a brute when I but admit a doubt of your true constancy. If ever. Without such cause from you, as I shall not suppose possible, you find my affections veering, but a point. May I prevent... <laughs> yes, she's practically taking his temperature now. It's, yes. it's uh, good boy. You know, you've got yes. the point and... Uh, yes. Now, calm, calm down. And it's almost sort of holding his hands. And yes. Very right, good. Yes. Very good. You see, it, it, it isn't dishonest, and it is funny when he suddenly does one of those mm. long Right, yeah. Yes. yeah. Go on, we won't go back on it. The contract which my poor father bound us in gives you more than a lover's privilege. Again, Julia, you raise ideas which feed and justify my doubts. I would not have been more free. No. I am proud of my restraint. Yet, yet, perhaps, perhaps your high respect alone for the solemn contract has fettered your inclination. How can I be sure, had you remained unbound in thought and promise, you would still have... Uh, uh, it, it was rather good, that dry, because uh, throughout the play, and, and a couple of times in this scene, the word yet is the most wonderful uh, slalom post for him. He right, starts yeah. off with one view, and he kind of swings around the post on the word yet, and comes out with a completely different view 
yeah. on the other side. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, for example, he says, I, I'm quite conscious of being incredibly badly behaved. I'm, I really can't do anything about it. Yet, I've got to do it. Yet, I must be sure she has not been so very happy in my absence. And this yet is the same, has the same function. The changes must be very, very fast and immediate. Because while they, I don't want to imply to you in any way that he isn't feeling everything genuinely, what makes him trivial is the speed with which he moves. Right. How shall I be sure, had you remained unbound in thought and promise, that I should still have been the object of your persevering love? And try me now. Let us be as free as strangers to what is past. My heart will not feel more liberty. There now! So hasty, Julia, so anxious to be free. If your love for me were fixed and hardened, you would not loose your hold, even though I wished it. Oh, you torture me to the heart. I cannot bear it. Oh, I do not mean to distress you. Um, if I loved you less, I should never give you an uneasy moment. Now, I would not boast, yet let me say that I have neither age, person, nor character to found dislike on. <laughs> My fortune, such as few ladies, could be charged with indiscretion in the match. Oh, Julia, when love receives such countenance from prudence, nice mind will be suspicious of its birth. I know not whither your insinuations would tend. But since they seem pressing to insult me, I will spare you the regret of having done so. I've given you no cause for this. In tears. Yet stay, Julia, stay but for a moment. The door is fastened. Julia, but for one moment. I hear her sobbing. Steph, what a brute. Steph, what a brute I am to use her thus. Aye, she is coming now. How little resolution there is in a woman. How a few soft words can turn them. No, Faith, she's not coming either. Julia, my soul. <laughs> tell me that you forgive me. Come but to tell me that. Now, this is being too resentful. Aye, yes, she is coming now. I thought she would. No steadiness in anything. Her going away must have been a mere trick then. She shan't see that it hath hurt me. I'll affect indifference. Um. <laughs> no, so she's not coming neither! No, don't intend it, I suppose. Now, this is not steadiness, but obstinacy. Yet I deserve it. Sorry. Yes, it was good. there were some very good ones there. Uh, I mean, I think one of the, the tightest slalom posts, this is not steadiness, but obstinacy, yet I deserve it, I mean, is, a, is an extraordinarily compact yeah. change of attitude. The, you are absolutely the right kind of level. It actually helps, curiously enough, that it sounds extremely mundane, to mark a script <coughs> in different colours uh, yeah. when the changes are as tight and as complex as this of mood. Yeah. So that in the preparation process, you actually have a visual feeling of change, 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 and then it becomes second nature and you don't ever think about it in that form again. But otherwise, they sort of upon you and they've gone past before you fully f identified them and filled them. Did you, did you find that yes. I noticed one or two getting into a kind of blodge of yeah. emotion instead of being yeah. absolutely defined? Yeah. Let's have a go at this bit of Private Lives, which is the, towards the very end of Act Two, which is a, an extraordinary kind of a, a duo of a, of a scene, very demanding, with, with just the two of them until the very, very end. And the sequence of the scene, one of the reasons I've chosen it, is that it's a series of rows, one after another, like a staircase. Um, the, the mechanics of the row and the weapons they use are different every time. Sometimes it seems almost polite. Sometimes it's sarcasm, sometimes it's pure rage. And there may be plateaus, but nothing lessens all the way through. Let's just start, begin gently at the start. We start of without that, though, don't we, really? We, you, start, you, you start out of the, the calmest, right. coziest, right. nicest. It still requires, I mean, you'd be amazed, because mm -hmm. these are characters of such extraordinary internal energy, Repose is only a relative term. Right. Their, their minds are never unenergetic. Their attack, a mental attack, is colossal, even though they may be practically asleep. So that doesn't mean it's kind of cop out for the actors. Do you remember that 
awful scene we had in Venice. Which particular one? The one where you bought that little painted wooden snake on the piazza and put it on my bed. Charles! That was his name. Charles. He did wriggle beautifully. <laughs> Horrible thing. I hated it. I know you did. You threw him out of the bathroom, out of the, out of the window, into the Grand Canal. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever forgive you for that. How long did the row last? It went on intermittently for days. You know how um, football fans, when they're discussing matches they have seen, uh, get excited about the memory of a girl? Mm. These are connoisseurs of rows we have known. I mean, they are the greatest rowers in the Western Hemisphere. And so there is a, a real pleasure in the recognition and the memory. Something of the energy of the row itself has to be in the memory, too. Right. Yes? Coward's rhythms uh, are very much taken care of by him. And things go rather wrong. You must be very precise. And you, have, you can't really hold it up, either, because I've forgotten that he wriggled so beautifully, and suddenly it's like... Yes, one could drive oh, it. Oh, my God, what, 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 because you're not... You're, there it, no, it, no, it's not. It's, there are, there are, there are really tremendous like gaps in coward. But there have to be gaps where something extraordinary is going on. I call them pings, pauses with stings in them, when there's something so thrilling going on that it's more uh, watchable and listenable to, in a way, than dialogue itself. Mm. And provided that's going on, there's a real tension, and there's plenty of it. There are lots of pings in this scene. Mm. Then it's terrific. The worst one was in Cannes where your curling irons burned a hole in my new dressing Oh, it burned my comb, too, and all the towels in the bathroom. <laughs> that was a rouser, wasn't it? It's was the first time you ever hit me. I didn't hit you very hard. Yes, capitalise on that. I like that yes, idea very much. It, I, I mean, uh, that's very Amanda. Amanda yeah. has lunatic logic, and she's exactly the sort of woman who would say, first time you ever hit me, a sort of wonderful, tender reminiscence yeah. of it, because it demarcated a new kind of row. You know, one, once they'd really got violent, then there was a time... First time we were trying to decapitate you. <laughs> give, um, give her that was a rouser, wasn't it? That was a rouser, wasn't it? That was the first time you ever hit me. Oh, I didn't hit you very hard. The manager came in and found us rolling about on the floor, scratching and biting like panthers. <laughs> oh, how utterly, utterly ridiculous. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Unfortunately, there's a stage direction here. Can you remember what it says? It says they the fall about helplessly <laughs> with us. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Do you know there's a, there is a kind of trick to that? Because it is a nightmare when you don't want to laugh and suddenly you're expected to be. Yeah. And they should be, like children, hiccuping yeah. and uh, clutching each other uh, by this, that yeah. stage. I think you have to decide that you're going to plant it much earlier. Before and then that. suppress it. And you'd be surprised. Just the sort of mechanism of not permitting yourself to laugh, just the odd snort or giggle coming through. When it's then allowed to rip, it, you don't have to manufacture it in the same terrible way. Mm. Take it now from the top and see if you can. And actually, are you ticklish either of you? Not Everyone always says that. They say no, and they are. Well, I think you're better. I think, uh, I think from the point purposes of this, if you, because you're not doing enough, would you please start tickling her mm. round about the worst one was in Cannes, and don't stop until um, we were very much younger. Yes? Okay. And, <laughs> okay. And your curling to irons burnt a hole in my new dressing gown. Uh, it burnt a hole in my comb, too. <laughs> and all the towels in the bathroom. <laughs> that wasn't oh. rouser, was it? I shall never forget his face. <laughs> oh, ridiculous. I want to be ridiculous. <laughs> we were very much younger then. And very much sillier. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the real cause of that row was Peter Burley. You knew there was nothing in that. Now, that was terribly good, what you did. And you didn't quite handle it. it, you, it it's almost as if somebody's pulled a sort of paper bag over Elliot. And out of all the laughter, he has this sudden memory of this chap she was yeah. unfaithful with. And I saw all that happening. Your mood just changed, as people's moods do, especially after laughing. Because you're slightly exhausted by it. And it's easy to go anywhere after a big bout of laughing, isn't it, emotionally? You can go up or down mm. from it. Now, she's perfectly happy. I love it on stage when one person's mood you see shifting one way and the other's it doesn't. It just stays so the same. So, so it was never really had a change. And then yeah. he says this rather time bomb thing. And he says it, it was dead right what you did. And when in doubt with Coward, bleach out the tone and let the words do the work. And you didn't say it accusingly. You just said it quite conversationally, but one knew it was dangerous. Right. And now I just pick it up from... What's the cue for it gave him a lot of pleasure and didn't... Um, um, you let him kiss you. You let him kiss, though. You, you let him kiss you? You said you did. Well, what of it? What of it? 
It gave him a lot of pleasure. Yes, but you see, you see. Yes, well, what of then? it? Well, come on, I'm daring you. What of it? What of it? Right. And then he says, it, it, he says incredulously, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, you, you, you let him kiss you, say it to me. Um, you let him kiss you, you said you did. Well, what of it? <laughs> what of it? It gave him a lot of pleasure, it didn't hurt me. What about me? Well, if you hadn't been so suspicious and nosy, you'd never known a thing about it. That was a nice point of view, I must say. Oh, dear, I'm bored with this conversation. So am I. Bored stiff. You see, it, her logic is... is loony, and she doesn't stop to look at it. She covers it with certainty. Mm. And it's only when it's gone you think, that's dippy, what she just said. Mm. Gave him a lot of pleasure and didn't hurt me. Uh, and if you hadn't been so suspicious and nosy, you'd never have known a thing about yes, it. I mean, it's entirely your fault. <laughs> it's a wonderful it's thing to say. Be a different class of woman for a minute. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Let's hear a note in her voice which isn't too pretty. Going out somewhere, dear? No, just making myself fascinating for you. That reply has broken my heart. It's the woman's job to allure the man. Watch me a minute, will you? As a matter of fact, that's perfectly true. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Oh, be quiet. It's a pity you didn't have any more brandy. It might have made you a little less disagreeable. It doesn't seem to have worked such wonders with you. Oh, snap, 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 like a little adder. Adders don't snap, they sting. Nonsense. They have a little bag of venom behind their fangs and they snap. They sting. They snap. I don't care, do you understand? I don't mind if they bark and roll about like hoops. Did you see much of Peter Burden after our divorce? Yes, I did. Quite a bit. Yes, now you see, if it had gone into the country, which it's just beginning to, mm. I can see it takes time to push you up there, but you're doing it. Uh, if hoops is in the stratosphere, then there's this wonderful dangling pause, she's sort of hoist by her own baton, and then somewhere out of left field comes this little quiet voice saying, Did you see much of him then, did you? Mm. Uh, <laughs> and it's a very, it's a, I mean, I hate to discuss laughs, it's, we, we, you know how actors are so pathetic, never say the word laugh, say things like, I think we might get a beat there, or <laughs> whatever, but there might, have, there might be a beat as a result of um, you saying that. If the pause, it's a pause that works, and it only works if you carry it into that point of, mm -hmm. of absolute lunacy. Anyway, well done. I'm going to uh, replace you two uh, with John and with Jane. Uh, I'm going to ask them to do something terribly difficult, which is to pick it up. So I suggest that if you two come in here, what we'll do is we'll take a few lines before this, and if you'd like to, um, to play them like kids, absolutely like children going for each other, just to make yourselves maniacal, come, come, come in there. Uh, just get yourselves into any kind of, any old frenzy, nothing to do with this play, to the point where uh, it's um, uh, rolling about like hoops. And then segue into the next se section once you've got your irritation up. I mean, just play fury with each other. I don't care how you do it, as children or just as two furious adults. Don't let's be subtle, because I'm going to pick this up from the next section. Snap, 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 just like a little adder. Adders don't snap, they sting. Nonsense, they snap. No, they sting. They sting. Snap. They sting. <laughs> they snap. They sting. They snap. They Jolly well sting! I don't care what they're telling you, they bloody well snap them, don't you? I don't care if they sting, snap, or whatever they do, I don't care if they roll about the floor in hoops, do you understand? OK, keep going. Rest of the scene. Did you see much of Peter Burden after our divorce? Yes, I did. Quite a lot. <laughs> I suppose you let him kiss you a good deal more then, did you? Mind your own business. He must have had a riotous time. <sighs> Very enjoyable. Now, it's, lot, it's gone down yeah, here again. Yeah, but in so fact, it's it's there, was some there was some marvellous capital to be made out of that. Because the way you were both kind of shuddering, <laughs> <and laughs> exhausted from the cushion throwing, is exactly the internal feeling, whatever's going on on the top, that they should have after their last bout each time. It is precisely that. And so the tone that you took, to, because you actually had to cover it to get on with the next bit. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. And that was the nearest I've heard today, when you embark on the next section, of really how it should be, the sort of control of ice over a cauldron internally. Let's go from, uh, I've only had three minute liqueur glasses of brandy. I think I mentioned once before that I've only had three minute liqueur glasses of brandy the whole evening long. A child of two couldn't get drunk on that. On the contrary, 
A child of two could get violently drunk on only one glass of brandy. Very interesting. How about a child of four and a child of six and a child of oh, nine? Oh, do shut up. Um, sorry, my fault. More vulgar, more vulgarity. Let's see that fishwife <coughs> on that. You see, really? Uh, you I was see, thinking I see... becoming two fishwives. No, no, it can go no. Further. no. <laughs> Uh, you see, you've got that wonderful tone on. Um, well, well, you know, I'm not really angry. I'm just terribly, terribly sarcastic coming out of you. And there's an... Uh, because she... You want occasionally has to open up and show the viscera twitching. Uh, and they are. She just... She can't think of anything else witty or crushing to say. All she can manage is, oh, do shut up. The irritation has reached a kind of boil boiling point. And very soon they try to kill each other physically, so we're getting awfully near the end of that. Very interesting. How about a child of four and a child of six or a child of nine? Oh, do shut up! We might get up a splendid little debate about that. You know, intemperate tots. Uh, not very funny, dear. You'd better have some more brandy. Very good idea, I will. Ridiculous ass! I beg your pardon. I said, ridiculous ass! But he couldn't have missed it the first time, really, could he? <laughs> 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 I'm afraid it's one of it should be one of those sort of ridiculous ass out of the corner of the mouth. Yeah, and then, like over the top of it's extraordinary. Once you start to sing the tune, you know, don't you? I mean, when you both hit that uh, exchange about on the contrary, uh, child of two, uh, and, 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 all the rhythms. I don't. I think they're inescapable in some parts of this play. Um, he, he's pinned them onto the page and. It's only right, really, when you're singing his tune. Mm. And you both began to sing it at, in at intervals there. Well, now, what I'm going to do is to ask Hayden and Oliver to have a canter at the whole thing without me interrupting, unless they get into difficulties. As a matter of fact, the real cause of that row was Peter Burton. He knew there was nothing in that. I didn't know anything of the sort. You took presents from him. Presents? Only a trivial little brooch. I remember it well, bristling with diamonds, in the worst possible taste. Not at all. It was very pretty. I still have it and wear it often. You went out of your way to torture me over Peter Burton. No, I didn't. You worked the whole thing up in your jealous imagination. Well, you must admit, he was in love with you, wasn't he? Just a little, perhaps. Nothing serious. Well, you let him kiss you. You said you did. No, oh, what of it? What of it? gave him a lot of pleasure, and it didn't hurt me. What about me? <laughs> if you hadn't been so stupid and nosy, you'd never have known a thing about well, it. that's a very nice point of view, I must say. Oh, dear, I'm bored with this conversation. Well, so am I. Bored stiff. Want some brandy? No, thanks. I'll have a little, I think. I can't see why you want it. You've already had two glasses. For no particular reason, anyway. They're very small ones. It's so silly to go on and on and on with a thing. You can hardly call three liqueur glasses in a whole evening going on and on and on. It's become a habit with you. There's no need to be so grand just because you don't happen to want any yourself at the moment. No, don't be so stupid. Really, Amanda? What? Nothing. Going out somewhere, dear? No. Just making myself fascinating for you. Oh, that reply has broken my heart. It's the woman's job to allure the man, so watch me a minute, will you? As a matter of fact, that's perfectly true. Oh, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Be quiet. <laughs> it's a pity you didn't have any more brandy. It might have made you a little less disagreeable. It doesn't seem to have worked such wonders for you. Snap, 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 like a little adder. Adders don't snap, they sting. Nonsense. They have a little bag of venom behind their fangs and they snap. They sting. They snap. Oh, I don't care, do you understand? I don't care. I don't mind if they bark and roll around like hoops. Did you see much of Peter Burton after our divorce? Yes, I did. Quite a lot. I suppose you let him kiss you a good deal more then. Mind your own business. He must have had a riotous time. No restraint at all. Very enjoyable. He never had much anyhow. You really are quite insufferable. I expect it's because you're drunk. I'm at least drunk. You always had a weak head. I think I've mentioned once before that I've only had three minute liquor glasses of brandy in the whole evening. A child of two couldn't get drunk on that. <laughs> on the contrary, a child of two could get violently drunk on only one glass of brandy. Very interesting. How about a child of four, a child of six, a child of nine? Don't you shut up. Well, we might get up a splendid little debate on that, you know. Intemperate tots. Not very funny, dear. You'd better have some more brandy. Very good idea. I think I will. Ridiculous ass. What did you say? I said ridiculous ass. 
<laughs> very good. Very well done indeed, because I thought you did capitalise on all sorts of things that had gone before. The only thing was, you got into a sort of treadmill, like a couple of demented mm, white mice. Yes. Yes. And, and you actually didn't allow yourselves to... F you managed <laughs> somehow, by surges of adrenaline, uh, actually to keep the internal tension, but I couldn't really see how your tongues and your brains were doing. It worked that fast. It was just too fast. Mm. It was like a couple of typewriters yeah. in a com competition. <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, there were moments which were absolutely stunning. And you, you see, there's nothing refined or brittle or uh, unreal about them. They're, they're fairly unpleasant, these two. They're physically very attractive. But they are arrogant, difficult people. There's no question of that. Well, has anybody got any questions? Some of the examples you've explored in um, high comedy uh, in the changes of mood and attitude have been very fast and very sharp. Do the same techniques apply also to farce? Yes, I think that they do, except that farce very often relies on the exaggeration of one particular element above all other elements. And the situation is imposed on farce. Situation rules in farce, rather than character, I think. Once you've found the single aspect of your character that is predominant, then situation rules. I think it's, a, it's much more subtle business in high comedy. But the speed of the changes, I chose bits where the speed of the changes was phenomenal to make the point. Uh, there are plenty of slalom courses that aren't quite as abrupt as mm. that. And there is slalom in, in other genre altogether, like tragedy. You know, there are extraordinary changes of mood. Yes. We've seen quite a lot about how to build up the energy within high comedy. What about maintaining it day after day? It's terribly hard. I mean, that is the discipline and the nightmare. Uh, and it's, uh, I was once in a musical, and I've missed it ever since, because the overture does a lot of cranking up for you. And you have to really get yourself to a certain temperature in the wings before you set foot on the stage. People do it different ways. Some people really start to behave rather stupidly in the dressing room. Uh, get you know rather too uh, worked up because the others um, become very internal, sort of crank themselves up by another process. All actors have a way of getting themselves into the situation where when they step on, they may not be born with a great deal of presence and personality, but they have it then. And that's actually what the work is. That is when you, you measure the work done on a building site in a day and find it burns up the amount of calories that an actor expends in 10 minutes on a stage. That's why. It's because you have to crank yourself into another state of being. And it's jolly hard work. Then, of course, there's the energy of new minting the thought all the time. And it's awfully easy to let your mind stray. But I tell you what makes you do it again is the restlessness of the audience. You don't get the laugh. So you think, hmm, let's rein in a bit here and concentrate. But it's jolly hard. Really good actors are, are taken by surprise by the next event in the script. I cannot say it often enough that in high comedy there's only one moment and that moment is now. <laughs>